If you would, we'll stand and look in the book of First Peter and chapter number one. The book of First Peter and chapter number one. Had a few customers last night came by the table. We'd be happy to accommodate you with some good music. I'm not going to go into all that again, but uh, we're back there. And if you'd like some good music uh, to put in your car and to listen to, why well, we'd be happy to accommodate you with some good, good stuff back there. Be a blessing to you. All right, we're in the book of First Peter and chapter number one, and uh, I, I believe it's necessary we, uh, to read the entire chapter. I think one of the last things we should do is apologize for reading maybe what is more than usual of the scripture. It's like what we got something better to say than it has, so we're going to read the whole chapter and then do our best to expound upon a certain part of chapter one, but make sure it's in the setting of the entire chapter and book. So let's begin in verse number one. Follow carefully. Let's pray first of all, shall we? One more time, Lord, we come and ask you in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us to give proper attention to your word tonight. I talked to uh, some that have come in from work this evening. Uh, I'm mindful that all the years that I've been uh, in the ministry, I've never lived more than five minutes away from the church. It's never been necessary for me to fight traffic for 20 or 40 or 50 miles and go through what a lot of people in this area go through to be here. So I'm thankful, Lord, that you have brought people here safely. And I know that the demands of the day and the expectations of the morrow can suddenly or certainly uh, steal our minds away. And so I'm asking that by the working of your Holy Spirit that you would have our attention even as we read, O oh God, that we would give special attention to your word and open our hearts and minds to receive from your word tonight. Thank you again for this time and all who have deemed it important and right to be here and to give attention to the word, like Mary choosing that part that cannot be taken away. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's begin in verse number one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace, the same grace of which Brother Jason has sung tonight, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Boy, that is some sentence. Somebody ought to say amen. Amen. Wherein ye greatly, greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, something is assumed here in verse 8. I'm going to give you one more chance to say amen. And that's the first line of verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love. <laughs> it's a little weak, but you should have been here last night, and we preached about that a little bit. Verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation... The prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. They were searching, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, 
which things angels desire to look into. In other words, when the prophets were making their prophecies, Christ had not come, he had not suffered, and they didn't have what we have as believers in the crucified, uh, buried, and risen again Savior. But they were looking into this matter, and they were wondering about it. And the fact that the Holy Ghost came down uh, is something that even angels desire to look into. Oh, my. Wherefore, now this is our text, verse 13 through 17. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, Leviticus 11:44, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God, that raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently." being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, the word of the Lord endureth forever. For, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. What a chapter. <laughs> I read a beautiful, the beautiful wording of this and want to say, why would anybody mess with this? I'm talking about the other versions, you know. Don't mess with this. This is, this is, this is utterly beautiful. And if you don't look like you agree, I'm going to read it again right now. now come on. This, this, is, this is wonderful. And our text tonight uh, will be sort of the whole chapter, sort of the whole book, but we're going to focus in. Uh, verses number 13 through 17. Well, we've prayed and we've asked God to help us and to bless this time, and I'll ask you to be seated, and we'll get into the Word. Somewhere around 40 years ago, probably it, maybe a little more than that, by now, it doesn't really matter that much, but I was preaching a revival uh, meeting in Lawton, Oklahoma, and maybe some of you know where Lawton is in southwest Oklahoma, and uh, I was at the Bible Baptist Church, and the man that was the pastor of the church was Brother Joe Sechrist. Now, that name probably doesn't mean a whole lot to maybe even anyone in here, but Brother Joe was a man that was really looked up to in our state in the uh, late 50s, the 60s, into the 70s, and I think went home to be with the Lord somewhere in the mid or early 80s. And Brother Joe was from West Virginia originally, and he let you know about it. In fact, you walk up on the porch of the parsonage there, and it said, West Virginia, almost heaven, you know. And uh, he and his wife, both from West Virginia, they couldn't help but talk about West Virginia. And Brother Joe was just such a practical, I called him an old sage, an old sage of a man. Had a lot of common sense and a lot of wisdom and a lot of understanding. And, and uh, this would have been the first time that I'd preached there for him, although I knew him before. And as I was preaching there after a service, I was eating a sandwich over at their house in the parsonage there after the service that night, and we were talking, and 
I was sharing with him about being at a certain uh, fellowship meeting that I attended, and I said, there's a guy I hadn't known before that I'd never heard of before, and this guy preached a sermon, and I told him the man's name and what he preached and uh, how I was affected by what he preached. And so I thought the man had done a wonderful job, and I was blessed by the message, and I shared it with Brother Joe. And I noticed that he didn't say anything. He just kind of went silent on me. And uh, Brother Joe had known this man, by the way, for quite a while. And so as we kind of went along, I made another comment about it. And I noticed again that he went silent. And I said, OK, so you don't like this preacher or what? And very kindly and gently, he said to me, said, now, Brother Sam, you can't tell a preacher just by what he says. You've got to pay attention to what he never says. Now, I don't think I appreciated that that much at the time he said it. I might have looked at him like some of you are looking at me. That's a worthwhile quote. Uh-huh. It is. It's a worthwhile quote. You can't tell a preacher just by what he says. you got to pay attention to what he never says. And I'm just going to tell you right now that through the process of time, I think I grew to a greater understanding of what Brother Joe meant, that it's possible for a preacher to do a lot of preaching and not say anything that is unbiblical, unscriptural, and wrong, or, or wrong, but at the same time will not be willing to say everything that the Scripture says. And I think as time has gone on, I think we've come to the time and we've come to the place where there are many subjects or many topics or many uh, facts and truths that are revealed in the Word of God that are ignored or simply not addressed anymore. Even some of the popular preachers with even independent fundamental Baptists and, and a broader audience than that might be really impressed with someone who only stays within certain boundaries of what they will preach on, and there are other areas they do not address. Let me just mention some. You don't hear much about repentance today. There's very little preaching about repentance. In fact, independent Baptists have even had fights over repentance. So you don't hear much about it. The wrath of God is not often mentioned. You seldom hear sermons that specifically have to do with the wrath of God. And I've even been in a situation to listen to some preaching where the tax demands some attention to the wrath of God. And it's jumped over like what? And never mentioned. Personal holiness. Amen. Personal sanctification. Amen. It's, it's not a favorite subject in today's pulpit. Man, I didn't mean to pour cold water on this service. I'm just telling you that we literally live in a time like this when there are certain things that are avoided, like the roles in the home. I, I used to hear uh, from time to time from missionaries, Brother Sam, you don't understand that where we live, it's a very matriarchal culture, and the headship of the man in the home is just not something that's a part of the culture and society where I labor. Uh-huh. And I said to some missionaries lately, maybe you don't understand that in the United States of America, just because of our heritage and what is true of the past doesn't mean that we actually understand as a culture, not a society, what male leadership means in the home. Because we have our own issues right here in the United States of America. I asked our church staff one time, we were having a meeting, we were talking about staff meeting standard, we was having this meeting, and I said to our church staff, I said, how many homes do you go into where you're trying to reach somebody, somebody's visited the church, you found a prospect, you're going after them, and where they are already believers, how many homes do you go into where the man is the spiritual leader of the home? And you know what our staff did? Laughed aloud. Said, like we go into homes where the men are the spiritual leaders? And they found it to be their experience and their observation was you just don't go into homes like that. 
And if so, it's sort of like we have the TV families now. If you notice how TVs are, uh, they interview people over some news event, and here's a husband sitting here, and here's the wife, and she's explaining everything, and she's talking, and I know some of you women are going to think, you don't like women, do you? Hey, I'm married to a woman. My mom was a woman, absolutely. I've pastored women. I used to say I love women, but you got to be real careful how you say that now. But I, I love them as sisters in the Lord. Yes, I do, and I greatly appreciate their role. But I'm just saying, you just don't find many where it's evident that the man is the leader of the home. Now, if anything, the 50-50 deal is quite a bargain. If you find that in the Bible, you let me know, would you please? It's not a 50-50 deal. And there is such a thing. It's not going to go away for any culture, any society, anywhere, the matter of male headship in the home. That's not going to change in the economy of God. See? But you got to be careful how you do that now. And all over the country, when these are addressed, man, preachers tiptoe around to make sure that nobody could possibly be offended by this. That's disgusting. That's absolutely disgusting. Now, to try to be offensive, I better explain this the way some of you are looking at me. If you, to try to be offensive is wrong as wrong can be. But to avoid truth so as not to be offensive is wrong. Amen. Capital R. Or W. I guess it's W. I'm just kidding. I knew it was W. <laughs> okay. I've seen if you're still there. Okay. So, marital role in the home. Exposure of false teaching. You got to be very careful how you do that. Because somebody might be offended. You know, I mean, after all, we live stream everything and everything's out there. And if you say something about somebody, you might get in trouble. That's why I never live streamed as a pastor. I didn't do it. I didn't want to pastor anybody besides that church. So, I never did do that. Well, you're missing and you're, I know, I know, I'm not, I, look, I won't be here much longer. It's about time for me to check out here in a lot of ways. So I haven't been married much longer, but I, I, want, I don't want to be in a position where I have to be careful how I say anything because I am responsible to God for the people that I pastor. I'm going to give an account for that flock that I pastor, and I want to have the complete liberty to say to them everything the Word of God says without mixing up stuff to try to make sure is this palatable to everyone. See? So you don't hear a whole lot about that, nor the New Testament order of authority. I mean, all, all you got to do is just read the book. And as a matter of fact, all these things that are kind of avoided in today's time are dealt with by Peter. Everything that I mentioned is dealt with by Peter clearly in these two very small works that bear his name. First Peter and second Peter. Everything that I've mentioned. But plus, I don't want to forget this one, plus the other matter that is mentioned in his letters has to do with the surety of suffering directly related to devotion to Jesus Christ. Peter, in his writing, assures us that if we are going to be true followers of Jesus Christ, then we are going to know suffering. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he is not talking about suffering like comes from floods, like came from Har uh, Harvey, that happened in this area. Uh, that's not what he's talking about. Do floods cause suffering? Oh, yes, they do. But he's not talking about that kind of suffering. He's not talking about suffering that comes from tornadoes. I've had a little firsthand experience from that. And the suffering that can come because of the massive destruction of a tornado or a tsunami. He's not talking about that kind of suffering. He's not talking about the kind of suffering that comes with terrorism. Like just happened in Sri Lanka. No, he's not talking about that. He's not talking about the kind of suffering that comes with dread disease. That's not what he's talking about. He is talking about the suffering that awaits the child of God for their devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you listen to contemporary preaching, you might never know that the apostle Paul, after he talked about his own suffering for following the Lord, said, Yea, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. Amen. That's what he said. That's either true or not true. That's what he said, though. 
And you might not know, listening to contemporary preaching, that the same apostle also said, Beloved, now are we the children of God. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. There's not a period there. There's a comma. And it goes on to say, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. See? Uh, you may never know what Peter wrote in chapter 4. You're right there. Turn over to chapter 4. This won't take a second. Look over in chapter 4 and verse number 12. Listen to this. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange happen thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad and also uh, be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On his their part he is evil spoken of, on your part he is glorified, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer. Or as a busybody, don't do self-imposed suffering and busybody in other men's matters. But if you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Is everybody with me here? Yeah. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I, I'm, I'm just saying, if you listen to contemporary preaching of the 21st century, pop preaching of the 21st century, you might not ever know that's in there. That the true devotion to Jesus Christ is going to bring suffering yes, sir. upon us. Yes, sir. See, and that's what the Bible teaches. It's still in there. Amen. And it won't go away. Used to be that um, as preachers would preach the word of God and Preach about the fact that suffering precedes glory. Well, that was true of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I, I'm waiting for an amen there. That was true of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that suffering preceded glory. He had a, he had a difficult time. We talked about this some yesterday morning, getting his disciples to understand this. That he must first suffer and that the glory would not come until he had suffered. And didn't Jesus, come on, without going to a lot of passages in the Gospels, didn't he give us fair warning that if we're going to be his follower, if we're going to be devoted to him, that the servant is not greater than his Lord? That, that, that the one who believes in Jesus Christ is certainly not greater than Jesus. As a matter of fact, if we look at the life of Jesus Christ and we see that his suffering, boy, did it. His suffering preceded his glory. Then do we not? As a matter of fact, that God was glorified in him when he was crucified on the cross of Calvary. He said so himself. That it was time that the Father be glorified and He be glorified. No, not by sitting on a throne. Not by a crown on His head, but a crown of thorns and a cross. How could that be the glory of God? There's not a greater demonstration of the love of God for sinners than the cross of Jesus Christ. The, the, the epitome, I'm, I'm talking about the very apex of God's manifestation of his love toward us is when Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary to take our sins upon himself. Yeah, suffer and then glory. See, the book of 1 Peter was written with this in mind. Because Peter wrote to people that were suffering. They weren't suffering because of a struggling economy. Okay, forget the amens. Uh, they were not struggling because of a struggling economy. They were not suffering because that disease had affected them. They were not suffering because they had some weather that affected them. They were suffering because of what? They were devoted to Jesus Christ. And you know what Peter is saying? It's going to be a natural part of our fellowship of him. Get ready. Come on. How would this go over the 21st century pulpit? We invite Peter and he comes up and said, OK, are you Christians? You want to follow the Lord? Amen. 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 He said, well, hang on because there's some real suffering coming. And that's what he's talking about. That's what this letter is about. People that are suffering. Because of their devotion to Jesus. 
Oh, I don't know whether I should do this or not. Oh, well, I'm already out on a limb anyway. Did you ever listen to prayer requests at churches? Did you ever listen to how few of them have to do with the salvation of souls specifically? And did you ever have uh, notice how few of them have anything to do with somebody that is going through real suffering and persecution because of their convictions and their devotion to Jesus Christ? And that most of our prayer requests, I've kind of evaluated this thing for a long, long time. I haven't done a scientific survey or written a book about it. But I can just tell you, I've paid attention and I've listened. And the vast majority of prayer requests have to do with physical health and jobs and economy. I said the vast number of prayer requests have little to do with being a true follower of Jesus Christ. And the vast number of prayer requests have everything to do with our personal physical being and our economy and jobs and such as that. Now, if you're looking at me saying you're a hard, you don't even believe in praying for people that are sick, do you? Come on, I keep a prayer list. I've been on prayer list. My wife's been on. Sure, I believe in praying for the sick. I kind of, yeah, I, I believe in that. And do I care if people have a job or not to pray for them to have a job? Do I care about that? Come on, I'm a preacher. Uh, we pay attention to tithes and offerings for crying out loud. Yes, I want the economy to be good. And I want the people to have a job to take care of their families and to be able to send money to missionaries. That's where it comes from. See, so of course I care about that. But all I'm saying is, don't you think it's a little out of balance? When you go to a prayer meeting and the prayer list has maybe one or two names or no names of people that have one heartbeat or one heartbeat away from hell and are on the hook and need to be saved. Or somebody that is really going through it, not just because they live in a cursed world and a society and a culture and a world that presents disease and danger and all of these kind of things. But for somebody that is in a hard spot because they will not compromise their devotion as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter's talking about. That's it. And it lives in this book, just like some of your favorite verses and my favorite. It lives in this book to speak to us right now. And, and I'm, I'm not a prophet. I'm not standing up here trying to sound like a prophet, meaning I'm not here to make predictions about certain things that are coming. But I can just read the Bible and tell you that on the horizon, there are many indications saying that the freedom that we have known so long in this country to live out our faith and to be followers of Jesus Christ, there are storm clouds on the horizon that says it may not always be that way. And it may not always be that way in my lifetime. And I've got 11 grandkids, uh, three children, 11 grandkids and I'm looking and saying it's quite certain that the course and the direction this nation is taking if my kids and grandkids are going to be true to Jesus they'll pay a price that I never had to pay Mm -hmm. that's what he's talking about now let me explain something about the day in which Peter wrote listen to this carefully as you know they were under Roman authority all right the Jews were under Roman authority and Rome looked at Christians as a splinter off of Judaism. That's how they looked at it. So this Christian business, it came along as a result of this person, Jesus of Nazareth, who is it, it is alleged performed many miracles, had many people following him, who it is alleged, I'm talking about as they think, it is alleged that he, uh, after he died, that he rose again from the dead, and that he was at his birth pronounced that he would be the king of the Jews. And so they just kind of took all of that. In, and and the Christian deal wasn't that big. Rome never processed that. You could tell that by the way Pilate dealt with Jesus. I said, and by the way, Herod dealt with Jesus. They never processed this whole business of who the Son of God was. And, and, and so having never processed that, they looked at, at Judaism, uh, I'm sorry, Judaism, and they looked at Christianity as a splinter off of Judaism. And since Judaism was a permitted religion in the Roman Empire, then for the most part, the Christians had little to be concerned about from Rome. And their, their life was not good. 
I mean, the whole nation, of the whole people of the Jews, they were under an incredible taxation. We can talk about that a while. I'm not going to do it tonight. But they were under, I mean, they were heavily oppressed by Rome. But they were oppressed by Rome because they were Jews. And, and of all the uh, people groups that were in the Roman Empire, probably the Jews were the most despised and hated by the Romans. And so they oppressed their lives and made their lives miserable. And taxation was incredible. I guarantee you, I believe that we are an overtaxed people here in the United States of America. But I guarantee you this, you wouldn't want to trade with first century Jews under Rome. You wouldn't want to trade with them. No, sir. It was a heavy oppression. And so Christians had little to worry about. But a great change happened in A.D. 64. You've heard of Nero. Now, Nero was a very ambitious man. He didn't like the city of Rome. A lot of wood frame stuff and not an attractive city. He had aspirations for a much more magnanimous city. He could get very little cooperation from underlings in the government. And uh, he, so, he was so upset about this that it is very likely that he started the fire uh, that was threatening to destroy Rome. There's an amazing thing because uh, when this fire began to spread and it never got under control, uh, the authorities could never find any real source of how the fire started. And it was also noticed that the officialdom of the city stood in the way of getting the fire under control. And it became pretty much common, common knowledge that this is a ploy of Nero to burn the city of Rome so he can rebuild and have the magnanimous, glorious, and beautiful city that he truly wanted. But the longer the thing went, the more people began to suspect him, and Nero realized that his well-being was now in danger, and he needs a scapegoat. Who's going to be the scapegoat? This is in the time of Peter. No, no, listen to me here just a second. I'm about up to hear people saying, well, it's really hard to live for the Lord in these days and times. I mean, we've had Obama and some of the presidents that we've had. How would you like to have Nero? A wacko completely. Even his own people knew he was a nutcase. See? And so, and so he's looking for a scapegoat. Who can the scapegoat be? Well, he not only hated the Jews, but he hated the Christians. And the Christians, yes, we can blame them. So he began to spread the word around that it's these Christians that started this fire. These Christians are against our worship of our gods. They are against worshiping an emperor like him as God. And they are against all of this kind of thing. And besides that, these Christians, they begin to spread it around. They have this love feast where they eat flesh and drink blood. No, I'm just saying they took the observance of the Lord's Supper where they took the wine that represented the blood and took the bread that represented the flesh. But what does an ignorant populace know? Let's spread it around that these are cannibalistic people. And in these love feasts, they actually drink blood and eat flesh. That's what he spread around. And not only that, but they are moral perverts as well. Boy, he's one to be talking, isn't he? But they are moral perverts as well. Because at these love feasts, they greet one another with a holy kiss. And these feasts actually turn out to be the immoral orgies that the Jews, are, that these Christians are involved in. And so he turned the thinking against the Christians by lies, by deceit, by taking advantage of ignorant people. And he began to persecute the Christians. Right there in Rome, he would take the believers, he would take those that were true followers of Jesus Christ, and give them opportunity to denounce that they knew Jesus. They would not denounce that they knew Jesus. Some of them, he would roll their bodies in tar, tie them to a pole, set the tar on fire, and they would light the gardens of his night parties and activities. Some of them he would take animal skin and cover them with animal skin, then put them in an arena and turn loose vicious dogs and they'd come out and devour the people while spectators cheered on. That's Nero. Anybody want to talk about how hard it is to be a Christian in the 21st century? Now that's what they were going through. Now we need to be fair. I don't want to paint a picture that's not true because that kind of persecution was not everywhere. Nor all the time. But it was somewhere at different times 
so that the whole, everybody that was a Christian under the Roman Empire was in danger of this. It's sort of like terrorism in the world. We talk about terrorism today, but we don't have terrorism every day or taking thousands of life. But any day it could happen. Isn't that right? And it's not happening everywhere all at the same time, but here and there, Sri Lanka, United States, the Arab world. It's happening here and there in London and Europe and all of these kind of places. Everybody with me here? Well, that's the way the persecution was. So I'm not trying to paint a picture like they were trying to do this to every Christian. But when there would be an outbreak where Christians would be accused in a similar situation, then they could actually take the Christians and give them this kind of persecution. And Rome would nod the head of approval towards that. So I'll just say this right now, as an American citizen, you travel worldwide. You are in danger of being the object of terrorism almost anywhere you go in the world, including right here at home. And that's the way the Christians would have been right then. It's possible that at any time they could be the object of terrorism. In other words, if they're going to be genuine, true followers of Jesus Christ, excuse me, they're not going to do it in secret. If they're going to be true followers of Jesus Christ, if they're going to be committed to the teachings of Jesus, if they're going to do more than just say, I have a mental assent to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, if they're going to go out day by day and fulfill the mission of Jesus and try to evangelize, if they're going to publicly be Christians, And they're going to suffer for it. That's what he's saying. That's what this is about. And he's writing the whole letter that he might encourage them. Encourage them to do what? Can I have your attention? Be Christians still. That's what he's doing. He wants them to be Christians still. It might get you rolled in tar and burnt at the stake. Be Christians still. It might have you covered with animal skins, thrown in an arena and devoured by vicious dogs. Be Christians still. That's what he's striving for. That's what he's pulling for. That's what he's encouraging them for. Now, let let me, uh, I'm going to do something a little weird here, a little different. Rather than try to go through the book of 1 Peter and show you, or our chapter and show you point by point, I can't hardly do that without preaching about every single point. And I want to stick with verse 13 through 17. So I've kind of written out a little paraphrase of what's in chapter 1. And uh, I started to say, is that okay? Well, I'm doing the preaching, so I guess if it's not okay, uh, this might be my last meeting here. So here we go. I'm going to give you this little paraphrase. I want you to listen to this carefully. That in chapter 1, as you try to step back and take a look at the chapter, and we write it down, kind of paraphrase it. This is, not, uh, this is not instead of the Word of God. This is just paraphrasing what is in the Word of God. And, and you can measure it out yourself. No matter what may come, here's Peter, here's what he's saying. No matter what may come to you in the way of persecution, suffering, and death, don't forget, verse 9, your faith in Christ brought the very salvation of your soul. Peter is excellent at reminding us of what we already know. Second Peter is all about that. And that's basically what he's doing here. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, if I'm true to Jesus, I might suffer. Well, don't forget, without Jesus, you'd go to hell. Amen. That Basically, that's what he's saying. Is everybody with me here? Amen. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, He says, uh, verse 10, prophets who prophesied of Christ, your faith in Christ but the salvation of your souls. Prophets who prophesied of Christ tried hard to grasp how his suffering could be followed by such glory, but never fully comprehended what you undeniably fully comprehend and possess as believers in Jesus Christ. Prophets who prophesied of him did not know as much of him as the people who now, after his death, burial, and resurrection, know him in salvation. Think about that. You mean I know, I can know more than Isaiah knew who prophesied of Christ? Sure, I think there's several times that the prophets prophesied things and they wrote by inspiration of God, which didn't necessarily mean that they understood everything that they were prophesying. 
And what they were trying to figure out is how all this worked, how suffering could precede glory. They're trying to figure all this out. You and I possess the very thing they were scratching their head about and saying, man, how is this going to work? Stay with me. You can study this out on your own, too. I don't have time to camp on everything. But now listen to this. And that the Holy Ghost so indwells us is something so amazing that angels desire to look into it. Now, that's what our passage said. Don't, don't look at me like, you weirdo. I'm not, I'm weird, but not about this. I'm just saying that's what he is saying. That the fact that, the, that God moves into us by the Holy Spirit. Now, hold on just a second. The Holy Ghost moved upon the, apost uh, upon the prophets, and the Holy Ghost inspired their words, but they didn't know the same indwelling of the Holy Spirit that you and I know as New Testament believers, and that is such an amazing reality that the Bible says our chapter... Even angels look into this. Amen. How could this be? God by His Spirit could live in every one of those who follow Him and believe in Him and know Him. How could that be? Angels wiser than us. Angels greater than us. We're made a little lower than the angels. A little lower. And angels are looking into this thing. Wow. This is amazing. And you and I possess it. Okay, well, it kind of get where this is going. Yeah, but if we follow Jesus, I mean, we might suffer. What do you mean you might suffer? If you follow Jesus, you will suffer. That's what he said. And he's saying, but no, no, stop looking at the suffering. And look at who you are. In Jesus Christ. Oh, that's what he's aiming for. This came not by tradition, our standing with God, our position in Jesus Christ. Come on, saints. Christ in us, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. I said Christ in us by the Holy Spirit. I mean, all of this came about not by tradition, but by the blood of Jesus and the blood of Christ who died and rose again. And you obeyed and are saved, born again by the incorruptible seed of the gospel, the word of truth. See, what he is saying is don't ever forget when it looks like it's hard to be a Christian, when it looks like it could cost to be a Christian, when it looks like it could cause suffering to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, before you focus upon and dwell upon the suffering, don't forget all that is yours because of Jesus Christ in you. Focus on who you are in Christ and not the suffering that comes because of Christ. See, that's what he's really trying to get him to focus on. Oh, yes, he's laboring at it. Well, then, specifically, can you get more specific about what my response should be to suffering? Or the possibility of suffering for Jesus? Can you get more specific? Well, yes, we haven't even got to our text yet. Okay, but we're there. Now look down at verse number 13. Verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind... Now, stay tuned, stay tuned. Make your, say, Lord, I'm going to say it right now. Lord, help us. They will follow closely here. This is so important. And wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to former lusts and your ignorance. Now, I'm going to do verse 15 and 16 with you, and then we're going to back up to verse 13 and 14 and end with verse 17. Look at verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, but as he which hath called you, how many of you are saved? Let's see. You're saved. You know you're saved. You're not boasting or, you know, being arrogant or proud. You just know that Jesus is your Savior, just like he's talking about here. You trusted him. All right. Then you are among the called. You're, you're of the called. Now, see, now I work here and I work there. I've never been called. He's not talking about a call to preach. He's talking about you belong to God because he called you. And you answered the call and you said yes. You believed in Jesus Christ. And one of the titles that is placed upon us is not only saints and believers and Christians, as is stated in the book of Acts. And it's not only that. We are the called. We are the beloved 
And we are the called children of God. Yes, sir. And we are the called. Okay. Now I'm, gonna, I'm emphasizing that for a purpose. Now look now. But as he which hath called you is holy. So he which called you to salvation. L listen to this. You didn't wake up one day. Just like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus or anybody else. That got, you didn't wake up one day and said, you know, there is some streak of good in me. And I'm going to find God and get saved. That isn't what happened. No, no, no. God, by his Holy Spirit, was pursuing the lost sinner. <laughs> and when you answered the call to believe in Jesus Christ, it was his call you answered. He was calling you to be his own. Not everybody answers. No, no, don't look at me like Calvinism. No, I'm not talking about Calvinism. God help us from that poisonous heresy, cancer, spiritual cancer. I'm not talking about that. But all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's, that's what the scripture says. And so when you answered the call to be saved and you said, yes, Lord, I confess my sin. I repent in my heart toward God and I have faith in Jesus Christ to be my savior. I trust the fact that he died on the cross in my place and took the punishment for my sin, was buried and rose again from the dead and ascended back to the right hand of the father in heaven, able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him. Yes, God, I believe in Jesus Christ. When you got saved that day, it was him calling. That's why he calls you called. Okay, now look down at verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Not just talking about your speech, talking back and forth, but he's talking about our conduct. Our day-to-day -day conduct. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written... Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, Brother Sam, uh, when I got saved, I meant to get saved. Oh, yes, sir. I mean, uh, I was scared of going to hell. I was too. I heard two sermons in a row in hell. I didn't want to go to hell. And I got saved. But when I answered the call to salvation, then he that called me to save me from my sin called me and you to be what? Holy. 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 I learned something. You can preach all day about the holiness of God and not hardly offend anybody. But when you suggest that be ye holy for I am holy, people start getting nervous. Yes, sir. But then you can get by with it if you just don't say anything about what holy living looks like. Right. <laughs> but when you start talking about how holy living looks played out day by day. That's when folks get all upset. Amen. Okay, now look down to our verses. I just threw that in there. But as he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy. Now, if you were in Sunday school yesterday, we talked about holy. I'm the high and lofty one. I dwell in the holy place. God has declared himself to be holy. If you ask the typical contemporary uh, professing Christian today, what is the ultimate attribute of God revealed in the word? Love. I guarantee it would be love 99.9% .9 of the time. If you're a Bible student, you know better than that. Amen. You know better than that. That he has first and foremost declared himself to be holy. That is the primary attribute of God. Everything else fits under that. Yes, sir. See? Okay, And so when we talked about that, we said that he is absolutely, for those who are in Sunday school, remember that he is absolutely pure of any defilement. Now that is absolutely so. In him is no unrighteousness. Amen. In God, there is no unrighteousness. Well, I don't think God's fair. I don't think you're thinking right. <laughs> well, I don't understand the ways of God. Well, no kidding. He's a little higher than we are. His ways are higher than we are. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we're upset with him because we don't comprehend everything that he says, does, and allows. Huh? Yeah. Okay. 
So he is righteous and he is only righteous. Now he said, be ye holy for I am holy. Well, holy doesn't just have to do with, now listen to this carefully. Oh, holy doesn't just have to do with the lack of, Im, of any, uh, absence of any impurities. Totally, only, righteous, and true, and pure, holy. It doesn't have to do just with that. It has to do with being other than, remember? Other than. Other than what? Other than what? Name something. Other than all of his creation. Other than all of his creation. Whenever I hear somebody saying, I'm trying to witness to him, like traveling on an airplane or something, and every once in a while you get somebody says homespun philosophy, you know, and they say, Well, here's all here's the way I've always thought about God, then I know I'm getting ready to hear something really, really dumb. I'm not trying to insult people. I'm just saying, if you put your brain in gear, think you're going to come up with a proper understanding of the God who is the, uh, I, I said, the high and lofty one. I'm just going to tell you, your brain will not comprehend. Only the revelation that God has made of himself is acceptable to understand God. Only the revelation is made of himself in creation and in his word and in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And so other than. Now, he said, he which has called you is holy. So be ye holy. So what does that mean? How many, anybody in here, if you are free in your day-to-day -day conduct from any impurity or any defilement, if you are free from any impurity in your day-to-day -day conduct or any defilement or any sin, would you please stand? Is this not working? If you are free from any impurity or any defilement whatsoever, let's stand together right now. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, it means we all sin, don't we? It, it not only means we have sinned and we are sinners by nature. Not only that, it means that we do sin. If we say we do not sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's what John said. Now, these things write on you that you sin not. And if any man sin, that if isn't a rhetorical if. It's not like, you know, there's a possibility that a bunch of you out there don't sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. How many are thankful for that as a believer, as a child of God? All right, so what does he mean when he says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation in your conduct. Well, what does that mean? Well, like God is other than all of his creation, then when we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, then we ought to be other than what we were. I tell you, the most amazing thing in the world that some people seem to embrace is the idea that a person can be lost, dead in trespasses and sin, and then get saved, trust Jesus Christ, and God moves into them by the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the dynamic of the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life and no changes are made. That would be like saying the tsunami finally hit there in Sri Lanka and that area of the world a few years ago. But so far, there's no noticeable difference. That eight-point earthquake came to Christchurch, New Zealand a few years ago. But everything's looking fine. Oh, no, there was a significant amount of difference. That F5, uh, F5 tornado came through Oklahoma City in 1993. Now, there's been a number since then that you might be thinking about. But in 1993, where it was recorded the highest winds ever recorded on planet Earth, and it stayed on the ground for like 60 miles and left a path of utter destruction. Imagine somebody having the audacity to say an F5 tornado passed through, record winds, tornado on the ground, but everything's looking the same to me. We'd think, you're a total idiot. Isn't that right? Explain that to your kids later that I'm not calling you about it. I'm just saying that's idiocy. Here's a sinner. Dead to God. Alienated from God. Dead in trespasses and sin. And by personal faith in Jesus Christ, receives the gospel. And God sheds abroad in his heart. By the Holy Ghost, which is in us, his love in this man's heart. And here he is. Nothing has changed. Don't tell me that.
No. That doesn't even make sense. That the dynamic of the Spirit of God could move into an individual and no change. You're preaching works for salvation that you're only saved if you do these changes, those changes. No, 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 no. Don't you go there. That's wrong. That's a false accusation. I'm just saying to you, when the power and the dynamic of, a whole, of the Holy Spirit of God moves into an individual, it produces change so Amen. that we become other than other than what we were before we were saved. So we become other than, other than a world that's under the condemnation of God in unbelief. Come on. Other than that. That's what Peter's talking about. And, and he says, do you understand that when you got called, you got called to on purpose Make decisions that are holy other than you would have made before you knew Jesus? Do you realize that you're to have a conduct, a manner of life that is other than what you were before you were saved? Did you know that you're to make the conscious choice? He'll go on to say in chapter number 3, to abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Look, the fact that we got saved doesn't take away our responsibility to make right choices and right decisions. God didn't reach down and by some mechanism or whatever it said, is to pull out our choice, our ability to make choices. We still have decisions and choices to make. And the choices and decisions we make are supposed to be governed by the eternal Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the decisions and choices we make ought to be other than we made before we knew Jesus as our Savior. And God has called us to that kind of life. Be holy. Look at me a second. Or look at the text a second. Look down there. Where he said, be ye holy in all manner of life. Well, I mean, I can see in this area and in that area. Well, how many areas did he specify here? Give me one word for it, a three-letter word. All. 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 Well, what does that mean? <laughs> Well, I don't look at money the same. I don't look at the relationship to my wife as the same. I don't look at my relationship to the world as the same. Nothing is the same. Come on, I, I struggle with this. If any man, about preaching that text tonight, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. You know what the next word is? Behold. You know what behold means? Whoa, look at this. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's all Peter is saying. It just didn't use the same words as Paul said. This is the this is the clear message. And we're to be holy in all manner of conduct in our life. Somebody say, well, this could be very convicting. Could be my foot. It's very convicting. Yeah, you know why I don't drive exactly like I used to drive? It's, I'm not perfect yet. I'm not perfectly sanctified. But you know why I drive different than I used to? You know why? I got under conviction about it. There's nothing godly about this. I, was, I knew road rage like a lot of you did before the word was ever thought of. Amen. You want to have your Christianity tested? Drive through Houston and Dallas on the same day. That'll get it. Oklahoma City is like going through a little village somewhere compared to those monstrous metropolitan areas. And I know Texans are supposed to be a good driver, but I don't know where all these nuts came from that are driving around here from some state. Oh, boy. That's why. You know why through the process of time, I treat my wife differently than I used to? It's very convicting. You know why I changed my attitude about some of the neighbors that agitate the daylights out of me with the beating of their... Boom, 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 music, and you can hear them two blocks away. You know why I've changed my attitude and decided not to get even with them? Because that's not a godly attitude, that's why. Does everybody listen to this? Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a, a difficult person to get along with. It doesn't matter if it's in-laws. It doesn't matter what the situation is. Our relationship to Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God that dwells within us is compelling us to holiness. 
And we are to make conscious decisions and choices that are holy and godly because he called us to be holy as he is holy. That's what the book says. Hmm. Well, I don't know. It sounds almost impossible. Well, you're not the only ones that let that pass through your mind. Look up in verse number 13. Now watch this. Wherefore, now listen to this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. And I'm, I've got to wrap this up. But wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Look at this. Be sober. Be vigilant. Hope to the end by the grace, uh, for the grace that is brought unto us at, uh, under the, you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, stop here just a second. He said, first of all, I want you to gird up the loins of your mind. Are you listening to this? We got some sloppy thinking that needs to be gathered in. Before these men would go to conflict or, or to do serious work or to run, they would take their flowing garments and they would gird them up. They would take a belt-like thing, put that garment up there, get it out of the way where they could do business, either running, working, or fighting in a battle. That garment had to be girded up. And Jesus said, uh, apparently, the Holy Ghost is saying, there's a lot of things in the mind that need to be girded up. That are loose. And the thinking is wrong. Wrong-headedness. Let me, let me tell you, the ultimate wrong-headedness that he must be pointing at here, the ultimate wrong-headedness is this, is that I can be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ and fit just fine in this world. That's wrong-headed as it can be. Anybody thinks that way? And look at me, there's a vast majority that flies under the umbrella, umbrella of so-called Christianity today that is trying so hard to make the claim of devotion to Jesus Christ while they fit very well in the ways of this world. Do you hear what I'm saying? And Jesus, uh, Peter is saying by the power of the Holy Ghost and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, this is not possible. The first thing you do is you gird up the loins of your mind. There is loose stuff there. Your thinking is wrong. You're thinking like the world. That's why Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You're thinking just like the world. As long as you, uh, as, as long as you comprehend what I'm doing as a man, you're going to miss it a mile. But he said, your thinking is wrong. Gird up the loins of your mind. And I'll tell you, we live in a world, we live in a culture, we live in a society that is chasing a mirage. They are believing that I can find peace and happiness and joy and contentment and fulfillment in this life without God and without Jesus Christ. And we know as, know as well as we know our name, they are chasing a false dream. They are chasing a lie and it can't be done. And yet there are many that profess to know Jesus and claim to follow him that want so badly the world's over here to fit over here and walk over here at the same time and find their way. That's the ultimate frustration and futility in life is try to live in this world as a Christian and fit. You, you made me do it. Amen. Amen. Don't you look at their faces. You just preach it. Okay. Amen. Sometimes i got to talk to myself. It's the truth. If you want futility, then you walk out these doors every Sunday and leave what you know to be godliness and purity and holiness. You leave it right here and you go out there and try to find your way in the world without being a true devotee and a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and listen to me, you want, to, you want an exercise in futility, try to please Jesus and the world at the same time. It's, it, it can't, it, I'm out of words. It's not going to happen. And that's what Peter is telling them. Guard up the loins of your mind. Be sober. You know what some people are doing? They're being intoxicated by the philosophy of contemporary so-called Christianity. They're being intoxicated by the Joel Osteens of this world. Yes, I said his name. Joel Osteen. They're being intoxicated by the positive thinkers and the feel-good preaching of our day and time where you can speak all day and make sure that everybody's happy about everything and nobody feels guilty about nothing. And that's just preach and preach, draw a big crowd, take in big money, and people say, well, he's got a bigger crowd than you. Well, the Pope's got a bigger crowd than him. 
<laughs> Hadn't thought of that before, had you? See? Yeah. May Lord, may the Lord help us. He said, "Gird up the loins of your mind," and then he said, "Be sober in your mind. Think, think right, think right." Boy, there's a lot of winds blowing out here. A lot of winds of change blowing across church life. Fewer services. Well, we just kind of went to a little Sunday afternoon service. We have fellowship together and then we just kind of go home. And that way people, oh, that way people have time with their family. And I just have asked some preachers and I would ask anybody. Now, okay, so in your study of the Word of God and in your walk with God, God convinced you it would be better to have church less and de-emphasize the preaching of his word. And this was born out of your walk with God. Well, I just... Well, if it wasn't, why would you do it? Well, some of the big churches are doing that. Please. I, I can't stand fads. I hate them. I hate the fads. I've been so far from following fads. Thai changes will fad, uh, fads will change all the time. Any guys that get there, remember the, you remember the Rush Limbaugh ties? You remember, you don't remember that? Rush Limbaugh ties looked like they're battery powered. They were real bright and everything, you know. Everybody's, and guys everywhere wearing the Rush Limbaugh ties. And I looked at them and I thought, man, that is, I don't know. I don't know. And about the time they went out of style, I was looking at them saying, look here, I can get this tie for only $3, you know. <laughs> And that's generally where I am on the fads. And then it's already passed on to two other fads by then. And so, I, and that's the way church life is. A.W. Yeah. Yeah. Tozer said something years ago. He said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. He, said, he died in 1962. So he's saying this in about 1960. And he said, with all the changes I see taking place in church life today, he said, I'm afraid there are people. Francis Schaeffer said the same thing. He said, I'm afraid there are people that are making changes and only interested in departing from something without having any idea where the change is going to take them eventually. Boy, did they hit the nail on the head. Yes, sir. We better be very careful. He said, gird up the loins of your mind and think soberly. Let your thinking. I've said there are young men in here that have been to Bible college and going to be preachers and stuff like that and serve the Lord. And I say to our guys at Heartland Baptist Bible College on a regular basis and the young men where I am preaching a revival and some of our graduates will come around and we'll have a little conflab and I'll say, get off of your devices. Yep, man. Turn off the, the uh, whatever you call all the networks that are out there. Get off of Facebook. Don't Twitter. Don't do this. You don't need iPods and you don't need iPads. And the difference between the two, I don't really know. But you don't have to have that. If you have a Bible, why don't you spend your time with God and let God make you his man? And you'll find if you let God make you his man, you'll be hypersensitive to the fads, whether it's in music or preaching style yeah, or study or soul winning or whatever the case might be. You put your face in the Bible. I would encourage every church member. You want to know what a church member is supposed to look like? Just read the Sermon on the Mount and be that kind of Christian. Boy, will you be a church member. Yeah, Whoa. I said, where is my hanky? I feel like waving it right now in the old camp meeting style. Good gracious sake. You live the Sermon on the Mount, you'll be some kind of church Amen. member. What are you reading somebody's post for when you haven't even memorized the Sermon on the Mount? Amen. Well, that's three chapters. Well, turn your devices off and spend time in the Word of God. You could memorize the Sermon. Some, some of you could memorize the Sermon on the Mount. I was preaching through it one time, challenged people to memorize the Sermon on the Mount. We had three men that did it. And one of them stood up two different times and then once in chapel and quoted the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it just flowed out of his mouth. He was such a gentleman and he just spoke the words of Jesus. Right, <laughs> Matthew 5, 6 and 7. And two times he did it at church. There was scarcely a dry eye in the place when he was done. Well, I'll tell you what's one of the best exercises I ever did in my life was memorize Romans 6, 7, and 8. I was young, you know, in my 30s. And uh, 
you know, reading about Timothy and reading about, I read from some people that fell into immorality. I knew of preachers and pastors that I graduated with, some that I used to work with, that fell out of the ministry in immorality. And, and my wife and I had big discussions about uh, faithfulness and being true because I'm looking at David and I'm looking at uh, some of the men that I knew that fell. And I'm just as capable as anybody else to fall flat on my face. And at a strategic time, I was challenged by a sermon I heard to memorize Romans 6, 7, and 8. And I did. Now, chapter 7 about ate me up. Don't ask me to try to quote any of chapter 7. That is one tough chapter to memorize. But I memorized Romans 6, 7, and 8. And it's not just like that was a good intellectual exercise to keep my brain sharp. Sharp. It changed me in here. Surprise, surprise, huh? Hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against him. What about that? Yeah. Spend some time in the word. What are we trying to say? Gird up the loins of your mind. Think sober-minded. If if all your thinking is coming off the internet and all the wacko, idiotic, silly stuff that's out there, and you know more about what some guy in Arizona is talking about than you know what the Word of God says and the last thing your pastor preached, yeah. turn that stuff off and get in your Bible. And spend time with God. You know what it will do? It will gird up the loins of your mind. You know what it'll do? It'll shape your thinking right. It'll make your thinking biblical. You know what it'll do? It'll make you think sober so that you're not intoxicated by the filth and the junk and the lies and the trash that's out here. Amen. That's what he's asking us to do. Yeah, but if you're a genuine, true Christian, you might suffer persecution. Well, he said you would. But if our minds are thinking right, if you read the whole book of 1 Peter, I don't have time to go into it right now, but if you'll, if you'll read right, you'll see that in the book of 1 Peter, every time he talks about Christian suffering, he talks about the joy and glory associated with it because your suffering more identifies you with the suffering Christ. Amen. <laughs> it's the truth. Check it out. Do your own study. First Peter 5. It's only five chapters. And you'll see that every time he talks about suffering and persecution associated with it is the glory. And the glory comes not because people are going to say, wow, they suffered. But it because it closer, closer identifies you with the suffering of your Savior. That's a fact. That's a fact. Right there. Let's stand. We're going to read verse 17 and I'm done. Verse 17. If you call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work, there is a judgment seat of Christ. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Another forgotten subject. The fear of God. Verse 18. You know that you were not redeemed. There's a judgment seat of Christ. You are different. You've been redeemed. You haven't been redeemed by your efforts and by silver and gold and vain, silly traditions passed down from one generation to another generation. You're redeemed and you belong to God because of the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We probably, we, we probably ought to think about this on a daily basis. There is a judgment seat of Christ. Well, I am going to give an account for my life. You are going to give an account for your life. Wonder what it would be like to give an account. Say, Jesus, I, re I received the suffering you did for me, for my salvation. I received that. I'm thankful for it. But not to the point I'm willing to suffer for actually living the Christian life. Somebody said, that doesn't sound right. Well, it's not right. But that's where many professing Christians live. I receive the suffering that you did for me to be saved. 
But if I really live for you, it's going to put me in a strange situation with my family. Or it's going to make the people at work wonder who I am. It might even put me at odds with some church members who are trying to walk on both sides of the aisle at the same time. I mean, this could really put me in a tight spot. Now, I'll accept what you did, the spot you were in, and the suffering that you did to save my soul. But don't ask me to do any suffering for you. How does that sound? Come on, in our thinking, based on, that's repulsive, isn't it? That's repulsive. But that's where many live. I just ask us to bow our heads tonight. Maybe somebody is here that needs to be saved. Maybe somebody says, you know, the change never came in me because I've never really been sure that I'm saved. I don't know but what somebody is here. I don't know that anybody is here like that, but I don't know but what somebody.